Major funding for this program has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding has been provided by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, public television stations, the American Architectural Foundation of the American Institute of Architects, and the National Concrete Masonry Association. Pyramids of Giza, of the seven wonders of the ancient world, these are the only structures that still remain. And remain they will, as long as any man-made object exists on this planet. The pyramids were already about 1,500 years old when the Greek historian Herodotus first wrote about them five centuries before the birth of Christ. They presented a tantalizing mystery to Herodotus, and in many ways that mystery has survived along with the Great Pyramids themselves, over thousands of years. Like every tourist who's ever journeyed to Egypt, Herodotus was fascinated by all he saw. The first thing he wanted to know was why these incredible structures were built. And then he wanted to know how. How could a society which existed 2,000 years before the flowering of his own magnificent culture have been powerful enough, ingenious enough, dedicated enough, and organized enough to have erected such imposing monuments on the edge of this unforgiving desert. His first answer was the Nile. Herodotus called Egypt the gift of the Nile. And one glance at the disparity between these arid sands and the green Nile Valley tells us why. For it was here, between the edges of the desert and the banks of the Nile, that civilization first appeared in the form of early settlements. These early settlers caught fish, domesticated animals, fashioned metal, shaped bricks out of the river's mud, and learned to make paper from a river plant called papyrus. They also grew grain, thousands of acres of it, in a land where there was no appreciable rainfall. They were able to do all of this because of the Nile. Until the construction of the Aswan High Dam in the mid-1960s, the Nile would unfailingly overflow its banks once a year. This annual flood, called the inundation, irrigated fields, filled canals and reservoirs, and deposited a rich layer of black silt over vast tracts of farmland, which would otherwise have been nothing but desert. As the flood waters receded, farmers quickly moved into action, surveying boundaries, clearing fields, and planting seeds in the freshly nourished soil. Such communal efforts also nourished these early settlements. And by around 3000 BC, there were established communities along the 600 mile length of the Nile. The valley and its surrounding territory had also become organized into two independent and often antagonistic nations, called simply Upper and Lower Egypt. This is a slate palette portraying a king named Narmer, who we believe to be the ruler who unified Upper and Lower Egypt, and thereby started the civilization on its path to greatness. It's kept here in the famous Egyptian museum in Cairo. Though we know very little about Norma or how he brought the two regions together, we can identify each of them by looking at the crowns worn by the king. On one side, Norma is wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, shaped something like a bowling pin. On the other side, he's wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, shaped something like a chair. From then on, the crowns were combined to symbolize the unification. After Narmer, there were approximately 30 dynasties spanning about 3,000 years of ancient Egyptian civilization. Historians group these dynasties into three major periods, the Old, the Middle, and the New Kingdoms. Our story takes place in the Old Kingdom's fourth dynasty, about 2500 BC. It is the story of Khufu, one of Egypt's most illustrious kings 
and the builder of the Great Pyramid. It was during the Old Kingdom that Egypt was becoming the major civilization of the world. Central to the understanding of why the Egyptian civilization worked the way it did was the role and function of kingship and the organizational network that flowed from the royal palace. Although the king was all-powerful, he was supposed to be led by a guiding concept known as Mat. Mat was the ideal of a universe in perfect harmony, as it was said to have been in the time of the gods. This perfect order also had to do with right and wrong, and how the society as a whole functioned. Mat was often represented as a goddess who wore a single feather in her headdress, symbolizing the delicate balance between stability and chaos, both in the universe and within the human condition. The king stood at the apex of a pyramid society, a few people at the top, supported by a huge base of peasants and laborers. This was an aristocratic culture ruled by a privileged class which drew power from its relationship to the king. And this king was not merely a privileged mortal. He was also considered to be a god, a god who drew his power from the very essence of creation. The world began as a watery chaos, which was called none. And it was from this chaos that the sun god Ray 